The Great Battle on the Volga. Films made by 150 army cameramen included in this picture. The cameramen who filmed Soviet troops in action were Bakar, Goldbrick, Ibrahimov, Katzman, Malov, Arlankin, Vasilsky, Vikhodev, Goldstein, Kazakov, Krzyzewski, Muchin, Ostrovsky, Sotin, and Shadronov. With acknowledgments to the state film archives. Scenario, Yuri Smirnitsky, directed by Maria Slavinska. Text by Alexei Surkov. Music arranged by Makarov. Military advisor, Lieutenant General Platonov. Central Documentary Film Studio. head friends, bow down to this earth that was torn up by shells, mines, bombs. This earth that was once sown with deadly metal. This earth for which the Russian people gave their most cherished possession, their life. Mamayev Hill. A tornado of war, of blood and death, crossed over this place. on this earth, which people all over the world now hold sacred. There is a handful of earth from here in the grim Antarctic today. History, the people's memory, recalls to us those unforgettable days. The summer of 1942 was a time of terrible anxiety. The firing line of the Soviet-German front extended hundreds of miles over Soviet soil from the Arctic Ocean down to the Black Sea. There was constant fighting in the key sectors. Battles raged on the barren sea. Soviet forces fought the enemy within the Arctic Circle amidst icy cliffs and snow-covered tundra. Leningrad, caught on the iron ring of enemy blockade, repulsed every attack. The 
the troops of the Leningrad Front and Baltic sailors put up a valiant defense of the city. The Front crossed through the ancient land of Novgorod. It was there, in the forests of Lake Hillman, that the Soviet forces wore the enemy out in hard-fought battles. The German fascist troops had been routed at the gates of Moscow, but were still close to the city. Moscow's streets and squares were alerted. Soviet divisions to the west, covering the approaches to Moscow, were fighting continuously. Although the Red Army did not yet have superiority over the enemy, Soviet troops were consolidating the success won in the Battle of Moscow. and all of Belarusia was still occupied by the Nazis. Day and night their heavy jackboots could be heard as the Nazis combed the streets. During the first year of the war, the enemy had captured a large part of the Soviet Ukraine. The wealth created by the Ukrainian people's hard work was plundered methodically and mercilessly. Train loads of slave laborers, train loads of food were sent to Germany. At the extreme southern sector of the front, the besieged hero city of Sebastopol, cut off from the rest of the country, kept on fighting. Among the city offenders were sailors of the Black Sea Fleet, known for their stalwartness and bravery in action. Months passed, but Sebastopol did not surrender. Aside from temporary successes, the first year of war brought the German fascist army severe defeats at Moscow, Rostov-on-the-Don, and Tikhvin. The blitzkrieg against the Soviet Union had collapsed. A long and drawn-out war was now inevitable. In the summer of 1942, the Hitler command had concentrated shock groups east of Kharkov and Kursk and in the Donbass, with the aim of launching a major offensive, smashing the Soviet forces in the south and seizing the oil fields of the Caucasus and the rich farm regions of the Don, the Kuban, and the Lower Volga. It was also the enemy's intention to cut off one of the key communication lines connecting the Soviet Union with her allies. Hitler's cracked troops rushed into the offensive. The Second Front in Europe was still only a promise, so the German command was able to concentrate more than double the number of Soviet forces in the southwest sector. About 90 infantry, motorized, and tank divisions were thrown into the enemy offensive. The enemy pressed on towards the Volga and Stalingrad, 
Their goal was to split the Eastern Front and cut the Caucasus off from the central part of the country. One-fifth of the German infantry and close to one-third of the tank divisions were in action here. Over a million Hitlerite soldiers. The Führer demanded that his soldiers fight on to victory in the East. And so they marched on and on to their doom. Fierce clashes bar the enemy's way. But the German offensive on the southwest sector continues. Fighting hard and stubbornly, the Soviet troops showed a fortitude that amazed the world, but the odds were too uneven. Again, as in 1941, the Soviet people tasted the bitterness of retreat. save themselves from slavery and destruction. One of the greatest battles of the Second World War began on July 17, 1942. In the second half of July, the enemy pressed the Soviet troops back to the lesser bend of the river Don. A major battle was fought there in the steppes. The Soviet forces fought valiantly, inflicting heavy losses on the enemy. The Nazis called the road to the Volga the Death Road. And still, by intensifying the strength of their blows, the enemy reached the Don over a wide front. They crossed the river at many points. Division after division poured into the steppe country beyond the Don. Meantime, the German fascist command on the Caucasian sector sent units from three armies against the forces of the Southern Front. The enemy was in a hurry to capture the grain of the Kuban, and even more important, the Caucasian oil field. Bomb blasts and the thunder of Nazi tanks shook the Kuban and Don steppes for hundreds of miles around. made an all-out effort to check the advance of the Germans. At that 
time, the enemy still had the advantage in the air. But Soviet airmen were fearless in battle. They gave their troops good support from the air. Regardless of losses, the enemy pushed on. Stalingrad was in mortal danger. The local party committee called civilians and soldiers to the city's defense. Day after day, more than 100,000 Stalingraders worked putting up fortifications on the front 400 kilometers long. Soldiers worked alongside the townspeople. Stalingrad's factories were turned into fortresses. The open house jobs of the Krasny Akchabar works smelted steel for the front. Tanks now rumbled out of the gates of the Stalingrad tractor works. German shock troops headed for the city from two sides. The fourth tank army had been turned back from the Caucasian sector and was to attack from the south, but it met fierce resistance from the Soviet forces. The 6th German Army struck from the west and after a three-day battle effected a partial breakthrough to the Volga near the industrial settlement of Renok. Fighting broke out at the immediate approaches to the city. Pressure was increased all along the front. Nazi forces had come right up to the city. They cut off the railway connecting Stalingrad with Moscow. The enemy already had streets and buildings under observation. Victory, the Nazis were certain, was already in their hands. But the Stalingrad Defense Committee and the Regional Party Committee were resolute in their determination to defend the city. The main role in the defense was played by troops led by General Yeraminka, commander of the front, and military council member Khrushchev. During those critical days, the people of Stalingrad joined civil defense battalions. Supreme effort was made to withstand the enemy onslaught. August 23, 1942, as the date of a massive attack from the air to smash the city's defenses. Hundreds of planes with black crosses on their wings carried bomb loads to Stalingrad.
but the front line city was not taken by surprise. Vigilant watch was kept over the skies above the Volga. aircraft system was ready for action. Fighter pilots under General Flukin made bold attacks on German bombers. fascist plane failed to carry out its mission. enemy triumph. 2,000 bomb hits in one day. of the day, the Hitlerites had lost 90 planes. German flyers boasted they had turned the city into a fiery hell. human conception was needed to continue fighting after such an air raid. It seemed that not a living soul could have remained amidst these desolate ruins, but that was a mistaken impression. survivors left their city, now reduced to ruins by fire and metal, and retreated beyond the Volga.
horses, arms, and ammunition arrived in the battle area. Red Army reinforcements approached the city along the Volga and on roads across the steppes. They had been sent to defend the Volga stronghold, and they took up positions on the front line. The air raid was the signal for a general and decisive attack by the Germans. They were in the city and certain of victory. Suddenly, the Soviet forces rose up from the ashes and rushed into a counterattack. The resistance grew stronger by the hour. Hitler had congratulated his generals too soon. Too soon had they made lithograph stones boasting that the city on the Volga had fallen. Too soon had they struck this medal in honor of the city's capture. The attention of the world press was focused on the battle on the Volga. In September, the troops of the Stalingrad and Southeastern Fronts struck a number of counter blows that weakened the enemy. In the city itself, General Shumilov's 64th Army and General Chuikov's 62nd Army waged a heroic defense. To the north and south of Stalingrad, the armies led by Generals Kuznetsov, Kozlov, Malinovsky, Talbukhin, and Trufanov engaged in bitter fighting. While attacking the Volga stronghold, the Germans also continued their advance on the North Caucasus, whose rain and oil were such a great temptation. Here they managed to press back the Soviet forces and enter Krasnodar. The oil district of Maikop was likewise occupied. German fascist troops reached the Caucasian mountains with the goal of capturing the passes in the main Caucasian range. Special service units were sent into action against the German mountain troops. There were fierce clashes high up amid cliffs and crevices. The enemy's way to the southern slopes of the mountains was barred. At Stalingrad too, the German offensive slowed down. They broke into the city, but did not have the strength to take it. Meantime, the Soviet forces continued to build up their defenses. Their raging, burning hatred of the enemy proved stronger than death. The events of these unforgettable days were filmed by Soviet cameramen at the front. The 62nd Army of the Stalingrad Front, which had been squeezed right up to the Volga, 
fought under unbelievably hard conditions. The defense belt, 25 kilometers wide, and from two and a half kilometers down to only 200 meters in depth, was under fire by all types of enemy arms. The dugouts of army headquarters on the steep bank of the Volga were like bird's nests in the sand. The military council of the army, headed by General Chuikov, who was in command, guided the defense operations from here. of the 13th Guards Rifles Division, commanded by General Radintsev, were outstanding among the city's defenders for their courage and valor. Stubborn fighting with heavy losses now moved into the streets of the city. Fighting continued for every block, every building and floor, and a wall was often the front line. Sniper Anatoly Chekhov shot down many a German soldier and officer. Forced back to a narrow strip along the bank of the Volga by the enemy's superior forces, the men under Gurtsev, Batyuk, Garokov, and Guryev fought on with supreme heroism. History has not left us the names and ranks of those who laid down their lives in the fighting on the Volga. But the Soviet people cherish beyond measure even these nameless film records. The wounded were taken across the Volga at a terrible risk. was known as Ludnikov's Island. Completely surrounded, it was a park of resistance which for 70 days fought a defense to the death. The 138th Division under Colonel Ludnikov prevented the enemy from reaching the barricade works. This small piece of land on the riverbank has become a legend. It extended 400 meters along the front and was 300 meters in depth. From here, reports were sent to Army headquarters. These brief words meant so much. Exceptionally hard, fierce fighting. Fourteen enemy attacks repulsed by artillery fire, counterattacks, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. The enemy has reached the Volga on both sides. They're firing straight through the division's formation. It was impossible to stand up to this, and yet they did it. Not a step back, the party's order came through, and that meant an order from the whole country and the Soviet people. Machine gunner Staratuktsev died the death of a hero. It was an unwritten law, Frontline Brotherhood, that the living gave an oath to those who had been killed, will stand to the death. An unforgettable page in the history of the Battle of Stalingrad was Sergeant Pavlov's house, where a small garrison kept up a defense for two months. Shoulder to shoulder they fought, Lieutenant Afanasyev. 
Guard Sergeant Yakov Pavlov. Private Ilya Voronov. Faizaran Ramazanov. Ahmed Turdiev. Nikolai Masyashvili. And Vasily Glushchenko. There were others too. Many of them known, still more unknown. These are just a few names and facts from the frontline history of those grim days. Vasily Zaitsev, hero of the Soviet Union, wiped out 300 fascists. A super sniper was brought especially from Berlin to get rid of him, but Zaitsev got him too. One hundred and ninety-eight combat missions were flown by Captain Yefremo, twice hero of the Soviet Union. Red Army men Alexei Vashchenko and Nikolai Seljukov sealed up enemy firing positions with their own bodies. After pouring liquid fuel over himself, Private Mikhail Panikaka hurled himself at a German tank, a living torch, and set it ablaze. Ilya Kaplunov of the Soviet Navy destroyed nine tanks in a single battle, the last after his own leg had been torn off. Matvey Putilov of the Signal Corps was mortally wounded, but clenched the ends of the wire between his teeth so that communications continued to function. Captain Ruben Ibaruri, hero of the Soviet Union, son of the splendid daughter of the Spanish people, Dolores Ibaruri, fell the death of the brave along the Volga. Eternal glory to the heroines of the Battle of the Volga, Olga Kavalyova, member of the Communist Party. She smelted steel during the war and then volunteered for the civilian guard. She was killed in the fighting for the Stalingrad tractor works. Another woman to meet a heroic death here was Gulia Karalyova, stretcher bearer, whose name was entered forever as an honorary member of her unit. Natasha Kachulska, also a stretcher bearer. Defending badly wounded men, she waged a single-handed battle and with her last grenade, blew herself up together with the attacking Germans. The Soviet people were unshakable in that terrible ordeal. They had faith in the triumph of the socialist system. I want to go into battle a communist. That was how applications for party membership often began, and there were many of them. The most stalwart of all joined the party. They received their party cards at the front line. Volga River Fleet and Red Navy landing troops fought with the city's defenders. Defending Stalingrad. The enemy broke in factory district and every shop became the scene of fierce fighting. Here you see the Nazis in action. Look closely. This film was shot by their own cameramen. You see how uncertain and cowardly their movement had become. Death lurked behind every corner.
Soviet soldiers adapted themselves to fighting amid the ruined buildings. Spurred on by hatred for the enemy, they gave the Germans no rest. Badly entangled in street fighting, the Germans attempted to crush the Russian defenses from the air. All this time, the city power station was kept working day and night. People took refuge in special bomb shelters and even 130 direct hits could not put the station out of commission. In the southern part of the city, near the shipbuilding yards, the work of repairing damaged tanks went on day and night. From here, they were driven straight to the front line. In this terrible battle, the defenders of the hero city were not alone. All the Soviet people were with them. The entire multinational country, closely united by the Communist Party and its Central Committee. Everything for the country's defense, all as one man to the struggle. Old timers, veterans of the first five year plans, went back to their machines. Young boys, little more than children, took the places of their fathers and older brothers who had joined the forces. Girls did their share too. Everyone who could help forge victory. Countless times, the men in the trenches or the enemy rear were grateful to these women. Millions of husbands were now soldiers. Millions of wives, sweethearts, and sisters helped the war effort on the home front. Men who had driven tractors and harvester combines were now driving tanks on the battlefield. It was the women who plowed, planted, and harvested. In the republics of Central Asia, women grew food for the front. Far from the front, in the Urals and other areas, the war effort was intense. The steel from these furnaces was for the front. More tanks, more fighting machines of all kinds were urgently needed. More bombers and fighter planes. More guns of every type and caliber. From the country's arsenal, train loads of arms and equipment were sent westward to the armed forces in a constant stream. On decision of the State Defense Committee, fresh units and formations of all arms were brought up to the battle area. 
tank unit that has been deformed anew moves steadily in. The reserves sent into the fighting were now well equipped, well armed, and well trained. By the beginning of November, the enemy forces had suffered heavy losses and were scattered along the front. The main enemy grouping of 22 divisions were at a disadvantage. The Soviet forces held firmly to their positions on the right bank of the Don, northwest of Stalingrad, and the exits from the Lake District south of the city, and then gripped both flanks of the enemy troops in a pincer movement. Meanwhile, preparations were underway under the leadership of the Communist Party Central Committee for a decisive Soviet offensive. A plan was worked out to smash the German fascist forces at Stalingrad. This tremendous military operation was to be carried out on three fronts. The shock troops of the Southwestern Front were to penetrate the enemy defenses at the junction with the adjacent Don Front, and by rapidly advancing to the southeast, reached the River Don in the enemy rear, thus cutting off their retreat to the west. Then the forces of this front were to link up with the Stalingrad front. Shock troops on the Stalingrad front were to break through the enemy defenses south of the city, advance northwest, and link up with the forces of the southwestern front in the area of Kalach. This would cut off retreat to the south and southwest. The troops of the Don front were to strike two auxiliary blows, one to the southeast to paralyze the enemy's defense on the ranch bank of the Don. The second southward along the left bank to cut the Germans off from their grouping on the Volga. General Yeremenka himself wounded, conferred military decorations on his soldiers and officers. Life went on while the offensive was being prepared. The grim, comfortless life of a soldier. Unknown to the enemy, the Soviet command was concentrating reserves and equipment ready for action. Work continued day and night on the Volga crossing. This was a front line in every respect, and thousands of people displayed courage and endurance under constant enemy fire. Machines 
guns and ammunition were sent across to the right bank on boats and ferries. Military commanders and old-time Volga navigators took their places side by side on the captain's bridge. Step by step, with the utmost persistence, sudden death was prepared for the enemy. the enemy was kept under constant observation. Officers reconnoitered enemy positions from advance observation posts. Then, one day, the three fronts went into coordinated action. The Stalingrad front under the command of General Yeremenko. Military Council Member Khrushchev. The Southwest Front, commanded by General Vatutin. The Don Front, under the command of General Rakasovsky. A crushing mass artillery blow was launched on the 19th of November. The day the Soviet forces began their offensive was the beginning of the end for the fascist hordes that had marched to the Volga. An avalanche of fire and metal was poured on the enemy from thousands of guns. Like fiery dragons, the rockets of the famous Katyusha mowed the enemy down. positions were heavily bound by flyers in the Air Force armies commanded by Generals Krukin, Rodenko, and Krasov. German forces had been stunned and deafened by the Soviet artillery and air force, the big attack began. Wide breaches were made in the enemy defenses. Through these, Soviet tanks pushed ahead with the purpose of linking up with the troops of adjacent fronts. Soviet cavalry forces raced through the breach toward the German rear. After breaking through the enemy defenses, the troops of the southwestern front pushed ahead in a vigorous drive to the southeast, bound for the Don River crossing. Later, 
On November 20th, the forces of the Stalingrad Front also struck heavy blows at the enemy. On the fifth day of the victorious offensive, advanced units of the Southwestern and Stalingrad fronts met in the snow-covered steppes near the village of Sadetsky. On November 23rd, exactly according to plan, the steel ring around the German fascist grouping between the Volga and the Don was closed. By December, the Nazi forces surrounded on an area 30 by 40 kilometers were separated from the remainder of their troops by 100 to 150 kilometers. To relieve their encircled grouping, the Germans now formed a new group of the Don Army under the command of Field Marshal Manstein. It advanced from the Kachelnikova area in order to join the encircled forces. The enemy onslaught was repulsed by the 51st Army under General Trufanov and General Malinovsky's 2nd Guards Army. The Soviet forces pressed ahead on the Donbass and Rostov sectors, threatening the enemy's entire southern grouping and forcing the Germans to make a hasty retreat from the North Caucasus. The fate of the enemy's surrounded troops was now decided. The Nazi command tried to use transport planes to supply their forces with food and ammunition. But it was useless. This scheme was frustrated by hurricane fire from the Soviet anti-aircraft guns and attacks by fighter planes. But the encircled enemy continued to resist. Troops of the 62nd Soviet Army were engaged in constant fighting amidst the ruins of Stalingrad. Stubbornly and without let-up, they smoked the enemy out of every trench and every cellar. The fighting initiative was now in the hands of the Russians. The end was drawing near. The plan was to slice up the enemy's besieged group by blows from different directions and mop up unit by unit. The Soviet command, through the headquarters of artillery chiefs Marshal Voronov and General Rakosovsky, in a humane move, on January 8, 1943, sent envoys to the enemy troops with an ultimatum to surrender. When the time limit was up, the order was given to advance. Enemy positions were bombed steadily.
bitterly cold January day, after the artillery had pounded the enemy lines, the infantry went into action. Nazi forces suffered enormous losses. The land along the Volga was strewn with smashed enemy equipment. In this final battle, the men in all arms of the service showed true valor and heroism. The enemy could no longer stand up to the pressure. Those who had come to the Volga as conquerors now began to crawl out of their shelters, emerging from cell and dugouts. In the meanwhile, units of the Don Front, after smashing the enemy's last defenses, had linked up with the city's defenders. The defenders of Stalingrad had withstood 700 fierce attacks. Two million men had been engaged in the great battle. On the 2nd of February, the last volley was fired. Quiet reigned in the city for the first time in 200 days. The enemy was completely routed and a mass surrender began. This was the way they stood when Hitler sent them to a criminal war. And this was how they now stood before the Soviet people. This is the way they received their iron crosses after Paris. And these were the crosses they got in Soviet Russia. This was how Hitler's crack troops advanced to the east. And this was the way they left the banks of the Volga. Soldiers gave themselves up. Officers surrendered. Hitler's arrogant generals, the executors of their Fuhrer's insane plans, surrendered too. The commander of the Sixth Army, Field Marshal von Paulus, also surrendered. Endless columns of prisoners. The Soviet forces smashed five fascist armies in the fighting between November 19th and February 2nd. Germany lost 33 divisions and three brigades completely. 16 divisions had lost more than half their men. 
91,000 enemy soldiers and officers surrendered. During the last days of the battle, the Nazis left an enormous graveyard of tanks, artillery, planes, motor vehicles, and armored carriers. These fighting machines had covered the roads of vanquished Europe on the ground and in the air. Now, there were heaps of scrap metal lying at the feet of the victors. Never in the history of warfare had a huge army suffered a defeat like this. The great battle on the Volga ended in a brilliant victory for the Soviet troops and was the turning point of the Second World War. The Soviet victory was celebrated joyously. Red Army soldiers, officers, and generals gathered on the city square surrounded by ruins. member of the Political Bureau of the Communist Party Central Committee, spoke on behalf of the party and all the Soviet people as he congratulated the victors and spurred them on to the final defeat of the enemy. Now that the fascists had been defeated on the Volga, the Soviet forces advanced westward. The dawn of victory over fascism could be seen in the fires of this great battle. The Volga, the Kursk Bulb, the Dnieper, the Vistula, the odor. The routed German armies kept on retreating until the inevitable happened. The Soviet army took Berlin. Hitler, Germany, surrendered unconditionally. men who stormed Berlin were tank crews that had smashed the Hitlerites on the Volga. These were soldiers who had covered the entire road from the banks of the Russian River to the Elbe. And now, take a final look at the hero city as it looked ghastly but proud when the battle was over. This is a story to tell your children and your grandchildren. The Soviet people had to pay a heavy price for this decisive victory on the Volga. No better monument could have been conceived than present-day Volgograd. The 
Soviet people do not bear ill will. But looking at what they have built up, can you ever forget the ruins and the of war? the immortal exploit at Stalingrad will never be erased. This was an exploit of another kind, an exploit by building workers. They found the ruins of the old tractor plant and gave it... It was they who made an old dream come true and connected the Volga and the Don. They harnessed the Volga and channeled it into turbines. We will never forget that this flourishing land on the Volga was once crimson with the blood of our fathers and brothers. We will never forget. of builders and heroes received many tokens of admiration. President Roosevelt sent this scroll on behalf of the American people. This symbol of victory was a gift from the King of England. battle shield was sent by the Emperor of Ethiopia. The seal of Coventry was a fraternal gift from the British town which also suffered the horrors of war. So in my Premier of the State Council of the Chinese People's Republic sent this bar relief. A memorial medal was a gift from the Defense Saeed. from all parts of the world bow their heads in memory of the heroes of this battle. A delegation from France. Envoys of People's Korea. State leaders of Indonesia. Federative People's Republic Slavia. Representatives of the people of India. the hero city on the Volga. <laughs>